Good afternoon and welcome to the College of Education Dean's Speaker Series. My name is Deborah Hassan. I'm Assistant Dean of Community Engagement in the College of Education. And on behalf of um, the Dean and our administrative team and our colleagues, it is our pleasure to bring you uh, Dr. Enrique Murillo um, to speak to us this afternoon. I just want to say a few words about him and his career and then I will hand over the mic so that you can hear what you came to hear. Um, Enrique Murillo is a full uh, tenured professor, tenured full professor at California State University, San Bernardino. He is in the research, educational research methods and foundations area of the College of Education there. He is a first generation Chicano, born and raised in the greater east side of Los Angeles. And like many of us in the room, he's a native bilingual speaker of English and Spanish. He completed his doctorate in social foundations of education at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And his master's degree is from Cal State Los Angeles in the same area with coursework toward bilingual multiple subject teaching credential. He offers both a generalist background in education and schooling with cognate disciplines in sociology and anthropology. His areas include foundations of education, research methods, critical ethnography, educational anthropology, and cultural studies. Dr. Murillo is the founding editor of the Journal of Latinos in Education, and he's an editor-in-chief of the Handbook of Latinos in Education. Additionally, he's the founder of the National Latino Education Network. He currently serves as executive director and founder of Latino Education and Advocacy Days um, lead organization, which is housed in the College of Education at his university. The primary objective of LEAD is to promote a broad-based awareness of the crisis in Latino education and to enhance the intellectual, cultural, and personal development of our community's educators, administrators, leaders, and students. Dr. Murillo is a former California Student Aid Commissioner. Um, the California Student Aid Commission is the principal state agency responsible for administering financial aid programs for students who attend public and private universities, colleges, and vocational schools in California. He served as the president and chair of the Ed Fund Board, and since 1997, Ed Fund has provided exceptional services to support students pursuing higher education. Established as a nonprofit public benefit corporation and auxiliary to um, the Commission on Student Aid, um, California Student Aid Commission, Ed Fund has worked to administer all activities associated with their participation in the federal student loan program. Dr. Murillo has authored more than 70 publications, has presented at more than 100 professional conferences, and is a recipient of numerous awards. I'm going to list some of his awards um, Education Nation Thought Leader. California State um, University Forgivable Loan, National Hispanic Scholarship, Scholarship Fund, the Southern Oral History Award, the prestigious Outstanding Dissertation Award from Phi Beta Kappa, Top Five Outstanding Dissertation Award from the American Educational Research Association, Outstanding Professor in Professional Growth Accomplishments, Outstanding Advisor, Outstanding Young Alumnus Award by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, of which he was the first non-white person to receive that in their 230 year history. Um, <laughs> educator of the Year, and the Outstanding Support of Hispanic Issues in Higher Education Award by the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education. It is a great pleasure to have him here. The advocacy work he does on behalf of Latinos in higher education is amazing. If you're not part of his um, listserv, get on it, because he's, they're, they're doing great <laughs> things, and he will tell you all about it himself. Enrique, okay. we give you a big Thank panther you. welcome. All right, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. OK. It sounds like I'm an important person, but I'm, I'm really not all that important. Um, I'm, uh, at heart, I'm an activist, somebody who advocates on behalf of the people who are disenfranchised. And, and uh, hopefully, I try to see myself as part of a movement that helps uh, channel uh, concentrations of power over to the folks who have less power in our society. And um, in the academy, uh, we're halfies. In other words, uh, I kind of view myself, especially as a, a first generation Chicano, uh, born and raised in, in the east side of LA, Los Angeles, um, as uh, one in I don't know, 200 million people who happen to make it to the university. And like many of us, especially those of us who are working class, not just being Chicano,
but have, you know, being raised working class, we oftentimes doubt ourselves. Do we belong here at the university? What are we doing? And part of my search in my career has been to create a, a model of activism where you can still be a university professor. You can still do what you need to do, um, write your dissertation, do the scholarly work, do your research. But at the same time, how does that benefit anybody other than myself and a few people who read, you know? Great, I have more than 70 publications. Um, and it's benefited, uh, I know it's benefited um, in academic circles, but once you uh, step outside the, the academy, it's harder to really say, okay, what have I really contributed? Um, and so I've always seen myself as somebody who, who's walked on the backs of others. I've, um, I'm um, uh, a person who, who's very humbled by the fact that my parents came to the United States uh, with very little resources and opportunity and created something out of nothing and uh, in a sense sacrificed themselves and physically sacrificed their bodies, if you want to put it in those terms, so that their children can have a better life. So I, you know, I'm benefiting and have a better life because of my parents. So here I am in, in the academy. I'm uh, officially sanctioned by the university to produce knowledge, uh, but whose knowledge um, and how does that knowledge serve the greater good? So that's part of my talk tonight. So before I uh, talk, I want you to just uh, watch about a minute and a half of a short video uh, that we produced just for this trip here to Florida. director of a large organization. Uh, it's called LEAD, Latino Education Advocacy Days. And every year we put on a summit, which is our marquee event, our kind of showcase event. And this year's theme is the crisis among the Latino males in the um, educational uh, pipeline. And uh, I'm here talking today, and in a couple days I'm talking um, at the Black and Brown uh, Summit in Tampa. So um, and I'm very lucky, I, 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 fortunate enough that I'm uh, at this Black and Brown Summit, they pick one African-American keynote speaker and one Latino, and 
and um, I'm humbled and, and honored. I'm going to be alongside Magic Johnson in a couple of days, kind of giving a big talk. So for this Flor Florida trip, we we um, we decided um, to to talk about our theme, the Latino male crisis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, and hopefully. Um, recruit some of you into some of the projects that we're doing, um, which is our participatory model um, based on basically raising awareness that there is this crisis in Latino education. There's a crisis overall, but unfortunately, Latinos bear the crux of that crisis. So, um, I always like to start with myself. Okay, so here I am, right there. Innocent. Now I'm not so innocent, but I was, I guess I was there, about a year old. I am um, born and raised in, in East Los Angeles, a little community called Huntington Park. And Huntington Park, interestingly, Huntington Park is next to a city called Bell. And for those of you who don't know, because obviously the Cuban community is so large out here, that Bell on the West Coast is like the large Cuban American community. So I, so I went to school with uh, a lot of Cubans and, and, um, and uh, so there's a connection there with the Cuban uh, culture and I eat my croquetas, go to my school, you know, go to, hey, it's a croqueta, yes, that's ropa vieja and all that stuff. So um, I, I'm, um, I'm uh, Mexican American, Chicano, I use the term Chicano. Um, I use the term Latino, sometimes Hispanic, although less, less Hispanic. Um, I also call myself Native American Indigenous. My mother is a member of the Tawe Yoreme. Uh, so we're, we're a Native American tribe that exists on both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, so I'm also, besides Latino, I'm also involved in, in kind of in our Native communities, rescuing and kind of preserving our old traditions as well. Um, my grandfather, my mother's, was the last hereditary uh, chief of our people. Um, and here he is right here. Uh, he was a fisherman and a canoe maker. And uh, this is where my mother grew up, in a little jacal, like a little hut. And so all uh, seven, eight people would, would, you know, they grew up in, in a hut. A lot of people don't think people still live like that or, or that was a long time ago, but that's not the case. I mean, there's still people who live like that. And so that's kind of the origins where I come from. My uh, grandfather was non-literate. Um, I don't like the term illiterate. It sounds very degrading, but he was non-literate. And, and um, so... I would go with them somewhere, and back in the old days, if you didn't know how to, um, how to even write your name, you would use your thumbprint. And so I remember being a child going with them, and he would, the thumbprint was like your signature. My, here's my father. Uh, my father was a union organizer. Also, they're, they're, both of my parents were from Culiacan, Sinaloa. Sinaloa is the second northern estate uh, down from Ar the Arizona. Uh, in, so it's the northwest part of Mexico. And um, my father was a union organizer, so I kind of became politicized because when um, I grew up in, in the union movements, being as a child, I remember um, we, we'd spent a lot of time, um, my father would be doing his union strikes. Back then, the unions still had much more power than they, they do now. Um, but it was, it was fighting for basic human uh, workers' rights. So I remember kind of being politicized that way. There's his grandparents. So people always ask me, well, how did you get to the university? I mean, I grew up in an area uh, that you would call drug-infested, gang-infested, um, I don't know, all the different infestations. I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, but I, don't, I didn't see it that way. I, a lot of people think the immigrant community is, is like dark and, and chaotic, and I don't know what they think, but my community was vibrant, right? It's vibrant. 
I mean, I grew up, yeah, you, you go buy your clothes at the swap meet, but the swap meet, it's, ha it's happening. It's, 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 a, it's a whole underground economy that takes place in immigrant communities that people are not aware of. Um, it's, and it's not particularly dangerous. Yeah, there's gangs, but um, if, you don't, if you don't look for trouble, then, then you're kind of okay, right? Plus, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a situation where I knew gang members. So if I, if I really needed to, although I would, <laughs> you know, I, you, you, you would, there's, there's people, right, that you can turn to, hey, these, the, I'm having trouble with these people. But, uh, you know, I got, I got lucky, and I think a lot of it had to do with my parents and their, uh, and I think just being aware of their sacrifices and their struggles, somehow as a child, I had, in, I had that sense of, my parents are really sacrificing. They're working hard, and how dare I do anything other than just do my job, which is do well in school and and and, and go like that. Um, so, part of my history, if you don't know, I used to be a DJ. In fact, I was uh, there's Ice T. I was Ice T's DJ for a while. I was part of the hip hop movement in, in the West Coast. So. Um, uh, like to think of myself as a, one of the innovators of West Coast hip hop, um, uh, so that's cool, you know, for me. And and, uh, and there I am, finally, at the University of uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill. But it's a long road, and I and I quite honestly see myself. And I don't when I say when I talk about myself, I don't mean to be egotistical. I'm just trying to say, this is my story. What's your story? But but it's important to know people's story because. Um, there's no way, there's no amount of research that can capture the, the qualitative dimensions of what I'm trying to explain. Um, and for all intents and purposes, it's practically a miracle, given all the odds that, that, that I experienced in my life, given all these odds, all the, everything that's against me, somehow I made it to the university. And not, and not just um, uh, an AA, but you know, bachelors, and then and then masters, and then the teaching credential, and then eventually a PhD. That that's a long road, and so I wish I had. Wish I had a formula, to say, look, this is what you need to do. But there isn't a formula. There there isn't. Um, there's only uh, the advocacy that needs to take place, right? Just for, for those of you who are not familiar, here's our educational pipeline. Okay, so here's, here's so here, Latino, Latina, Latino, American Indian, African American, white, Asian American. So these are national, national numbers. Where I come from, particularly in, in the city of San Bernardino, we have as high as 50%. Uh, dropout rate. Of course, it depends on what paradigm you're functioning because we also can refer to it as a push-out rate. So it depends uh, what, you, what you see the roles that schools are playing, whether we're dropping out or being pushed out, right? Now, so, the, so these numbers are a little, I think they, I think they fudge with these numbers because I've been around research a long time to know that these numbers are definitely fudged. We do not actually know how many kids leave high school. We really don't. Um, but we do know is that our pipeline, that we're, here we're just talking about the high school and then post back and, uh, and graduates. But the issue really comes from pre-K, right? And, and so in the Latino community, as high as 70% of our community does not have access to quality pre-K. 70%. Think about it. In the United States, only 30% of Latino communities have access to pre-K. And people say, well, why can't this and why can't that? Well, it starts, it starts kind of at an early age, right? And um, uh, just to give you a sense there, the, uh, American Indian, not too different. African American, same thing, not too different, that kind of stuff. Of course, as we know, the Asians have been out competing the whites for the for several years now. So, Latinos were at the at the lowest uh, level here. 
What we do know from the research is, is this, right? Latino students attend schools with fewer resources, staffing, and programs. Um, that's self-explanatory. If you just look at the budgets, at the money that goes into different schools, right? There's, there's fewer resources at these schools. We have a higher mobility rate of students and, and teachers, which means, you know, um, students come and go, come and go, and teachers come and go. I mean, I taught, I taught elementary school for a number of years, and um, believe me, there was a lot of times where I just like, I can't deal with this, it's too hard, right? Um, eventually, after a certain amount of years, I, I said, you know, the classroom's not for me. I'm going to go off and get my PhD and do other stuff. Why? Because what's more strategic than being a teacher than being a teacher of teachers? So if I can have access to these teachers, then maybe, maybe I can have more influence, right? We're located, obviously, in high poverty rates, racially segregated with academically segregated tracks, right? Less qualified teachers. I myself was a very unqualified teacher. I got thrown in the classroom with, a, with the emergency credential. I don't know what it's called here, but in California and, and about 15 states in the United States, they offer these emergency credentials, which means if you've got a bachelor's degree and you can pass this test, go ahead. You, you, they throw you in the classroom. So that's what I did. I, I got thrown in the classroom. And it, it took me a few years you know, to kind of figure out what I was doing. Um, this, is, this is a very important thing. We have more and uh, harsher discipline, and that's part of the one of the factors of the Latino male crisis: lower expectations, and this thing called the handshake problem, which is here's the school, here's the home. In my particular situation, I lived a bifurcated reality. Right, my father was very clear: um, de la casa pa dentro estás en México, right? From the door in, you're in Mexico, right? And then once you step outside the door, that's you're in the United States, right? And so you go to school, and there's one reality. Then you come home, there's another reality. Now, some children are fortunate enough that it matches the expectations at home. Uh, home matches that with the school, and it all kind of kind of works out. But what happens when your life is bifurcated? Right? So it's one reality here. And so we spend, um, we spend a lot of our lifetimes kind of making up for that, uh, that, um, that mismatch. Okay. As you know, statistically since 1998, Latino children are, had already been the largest demographic in the U.S., right? Uh, but here's the thing. There is still a lack of awareness that there is this crisis in Latino education. And I say Latino crisis. And people, like they, don't, like, they don't understand. I thought everything was good, right? I thought you guys got civil rights. I thought you guys, I thought you guys had bilingual ed. I thought you guys had this. I thought you did. Well, yeah, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of progress. But uh, since the Reagan 80s, there's, uh, most of the things have, have reversed. So bilingual education has been uh, taken away in most states. Um, Ethnic there's a fight right now to maintain ethnic studies, right? That's being rolled back. Um, we, we have to fight every year for a certain amount of financial aid to make sure there's a large pool of financial aid for the, the lower socioeconomic groups. Um, all these things that we have to, that we spend our whole lives fighting for it year after year after year. Uh, but there, yes, there's still a crisis. Okay. Um, what happens? <coughs> Vulgarmente decimos en español, somos un chingo y seremos más, right? There's a lot of us. There's a lot of raza. There's a lot of Latinos, right? And, and there's more coming, right? And there's more being born. In fact, boom, there, another one just got born right now, right? <laughs> boom, there's another one, right? And so we're growing at a faster rate. All these things are happening. So what happens when you've got a large population uh, of people, but their economic um, situation is one that they desperately need formal education, need an education, right? 
yet our educational outcomes are not keeping up to par, right? Somos muchos, right? A, a minoría más grande en los Estados Unidos. Sin embargo, nuestro logro educativo no se está eh, igualando, emparejando, right? So, demographic growth, uh, uh, but our educational outcomes and attainment is basically the same as, as it was 40, 50 years ago. I had a we had a conversation with some of the graduate students a little while ago, and one of the somebody asked, well, how, how things are going? And I said, well, you could ask me 50 years ago, and I would have told you, <laughs> I would have told you a very similar thing, but it's been about 50 years. Yes, there's, there's, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of, Progress. There's been a lot. Of, we've come a long way. So don't get me wrong. We've come a long way. Uh, but one thing is to provide access. The other thing is is outcomes, right? So we're living a paradox where most people, especially when we're, we're thinking about uh, equity, they think in terms of access. Where everybody everybody can go to school. Everybody has access, right? But the paradigm that I'm functioning and I ask people to function is to look at the outcomes. Look at the, we want to talk about equity, you want to look at the outcomes. That's the thing. So, and, and yes, last couple of years there's been a surge. There's been more Latinos into higher education overall. But we're not crossing the finish line. Finish, right? Yeah, we're getting to college. We've done a lot to get, get you here. But now what? We gotta, there's a whole other set of factors that come into play so that you can graduate. Of course, this provides an opportunity, right? The less Latinos who, who uh, uh, go on to higher education and so forth and or become productive folks, it provides a pipeline to prison, right? And, and so that's one of the consequences is that um, you know social exclusion, educational failure, and economic insolvency? That's that's one of the results of having a lower educational outcomes. Okay, so let me let me uh, um, share this with you. Um, this is uh, Novelas Educativas is one of our partner projects that comes out of our lead network. And what we do is, what we, what, uh, and it goes back to what I was talking earlier. Um, I can write a book, and I've written 10 or 12 books. I can write an article. I've written a whole bunch of articles, right? But it's not as powerful as showing you a video, at least in, in a lot of circles, right? With the common folk, with the, con la gente, right? So we have this project called Novelas Educativas uh, that we partner for the partner projects, and we take the um, the kind of typical Latin American novella, right, and and we give it an educational theme. So we have different novelas. I wish I could show more with you tonight, but we have a novella of of um, of a young girl who's at the kitchen table trying to do her homework, and and la mamá comes. Hey, los trastes, what are you doing? The dishes are dirty, the house is not clean, and so the, the whole conflict between the mother and the daughter about uh, los quehaceres and the, the chores have to be done in the house and that whole conflict. Um, and then, uh, so that's one of them. We've have an, we have another one about financial aid, right, to, to uh, make people aware that there's financial aid av available. We... Um, we have one that we just finished uh, uh, with Nick Cannon. Uh, soy tu hija, soy tu, digo, soy tu niña. It has to do with uh, teenage pregnancy. We have, a, we have a, a bunch of novelas. So we made a special novella just for our trip here to Florida. So I'll show it for you. It's only about five minutes. Just let me leave off where, where we were last time.
So there you go. Just for you guys. New novella. Um, first ones to see it. I hope you, you liked it.
that's part of the work that we do is we, we, uh, we figure that showing somebody a novella tells the story just a little bit better than, the, than, the, um, than sometimes even more powerful than writing a book on it. So that's the kind of work that we do. Um, yes, there's a crisis in Latino Latino, but just like in the movie, how do we turn the crisis into an opportunity? Uh, so uh, part of our lead projects, we feel is we have, to do, we have to do something different. It's been 50 years now. I don't know, something innovative. Uh, so that's, that's uh, what we see. Now, of course, why, why are Latinos important? Well, I, I, I tell some folks, especially if they're at the retirement age, was, do, you want to, do you want to get a Social Security check? Right? Because did you know, right, that you need a strong enough tax base in order to provide Social Security funds, right? And so who, who, do, who are Latinos in this kind of global society? Well, in the United States, we are a large portion of uh, the tax base and, of course, the labor. So here are the opportunities, right? Increase, um, increase, um, increase uh, diversity. Uh, consumption, investment pool. I think we're, we're a natural tie with Mexico, with Latin America, with all, the, all these things. I mean, we're just the natural, we are an organic linkage like that. In the most simplest of terms, the strength of our educational system and its place in the competitive global economy depends largely. I, I should just change that, will depend. I said it already depends largely on the uh, educational outcomes among Latino students. It hurts everybody. It's in everyone's interest that we work together to solve this crisis in, in Latino education. Right? That doesn't mean that you don't engage in, uh, to solve the overall crisis in education. Right? But Latinos, we're like the poster child. We're like, we're in, we're like the, uh, that's a terrible word. Huh? Sorry about that. It's, we're in, 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 em, em, emblematic is the term. We're emblematic of the crisis because right? we, bear, we bear the crux like that. So our movement is called Net Roots Movement and it's a combination of net because we take advantage of all the internet based technologies, right? And then roots because of course we, we take the elements of the kind of the grassroots that we call our, our movement a, a net, net roots. And um, we believe uh, that the the solution to our dilemma is community activism and democratic participation. Now, we don't necessarily have to uh, hit the streets anymore, although, although if, it be, if, it, it, if it has to be, we may have to hit the streets, right? We don't necessarily have to uh, jump in front of bullets or dodge trains, right? There's other forms of activism. So the idea here is the work takes place wherever you're at, right? If you're a, a student, then the work takes place as a student. If you are a member uh, of, if you're a staff person who works in the financial aid office, then the work takes place there. If you are a professor, the work takes place there. That, that's the idea. The work takes place wherever you're at. So again, uh, most of us, and there, uh, our, right now our network is, is pretty large. We have more than 1,500 chapters across 32 countries, right? So we're, we're pretty large, uh, this organization. And, uh, but the majority of us are in institution of, institutions of higher education, and, which are criticized, often for good reason, because we, we tend to have isolated ourselves. And, um, and, you know, we isolate ourselves from the surrounding context and we're criticized uh, for not being more engaged in the communities. Right? I'm, I'm actually very happy that there's a whole office of uh, community engagement. And uh, before I forget, let me, uh, let me thank uh, uh, Fabiola and Deborah and, and Dean Garcia for, in, for inviting, inviting me here. And I'm here with, uh, with uh, Patty. Patty, raise your hand. We're here together. We're making a... We're here uh, kind of making a little mini vacation out of it here in, in, in south of Florida. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear you actually have an office called, and your, and your campus president is actually very active in this in community engagement. Why? Because we've been criticized, and for good reason, for not engaging 
our communities. Um, although in education, we've always had, we, we, by nature, we engage our communities. But I'm talking about the academy in general. Um, so we have to climb out of the ivory tower and, um, and, and work directly or indirectly in those institutions and community, the multiple communities that we straddle, right? So um, that's important to us. So let me show you another quick video. This is a short one as well of who we are. I promise this is the last video. Housed at California State University San Bernardino, LEAD, the Latino Education and Advocacy Days, serves as an umbrella organization for innovative projects, programs, and events for the Latino community. LEAD's impact and success is grounded on solid research, collaboration, participation, and outreach. LEAD's marquee event, the annual Latino Education Advocacy Days Summit, draws tens of thousands of people in person and watching from around the world. The event tackles issues specific to Latinos and showcases working solutions from around the nation. LEAD also addresses local issues at the Feria Educativa College and Career Fair to promote college-going opportunities for local Latino families. The LEAD organization depends on significant participation and partnerships in the region and nationally, and strong interactive connections with Latino networks in the U.S. and Latin America, and with indigenous peoples throughout the world. The various LEAD networks agree there are important issues that directly or indirectly affect higher education institutions and the multiple communities they straddle. Those issues require colleges and universities to do the action work that is most relevant for their respective local communities, and in such a way that they can be used to inform and shape policy. Put simply, the LEAD movement engages the Latino community, and the singular most achievable solution to our educational dilemma lies in community activism and democratic participation. Netroots is one way to describe the LEAD organization's methods of awareness raising, education, promotion, advocacy, activism, analysis, discussion, critique, and dissemination of educational issues that impact Latinos. The word is a combination of internet and grassroots, reflecting the technological innovations, participatory democracy, and campaign-oriented activities that set LEADS techniques apart from other forms of education and advocacy. Are you ready to make a difference in the Latino community? Are you ready to connect with and be part of Latino educational leadership? Are you ready to find cross-sector solutions to improve the education and lives of all students? Raise your hand. Step in and get involved. Please join us as we convene those sharing the common interest and commitment to educational issues that impact Latinos. Okay, so one of the things that we deal with uh, um, is identity and culture. You can, this is across for a, all groups, but for, for Latinos in particular, we always have to talk about identity and culture. Right? And, in, and of course, we're, we're academics as well, so in the social sciences, uh, we have our kind of, our, our, uh, our trinity, the big ones, uh, race, class, and gender. Right? We always got to talk about race, class, and gender. Okay? no matter what. Uh, just out of, for convenience sake, we usually we, we, uh, we talk about the, th the three as if they're separate, but they're, you can't separate the effects of one from the other. In fact, oftentimes it's, it's so blurry, we, we don't know where one ends and the other one begins. So we talk about all three. Of course there's more, right? There's sexual orientation, there's language, there's religion, there's um, uh, bodily politics. There's all sorts of things taking place, but the, those are the, the three big ones. 
we, uh, so we treat it separately, but of course they're, they're intersectional, right? We, um, we have to treat identity in the, in the broader terms, right? Uh, the, back uh, in the old days, we used to treat identity, it was very psychologized. Um, we would look at identity as, um, and um, so not, the, not your head if this sounds familiar, somehow we're born, uh, and then right around adolescence, we start forming our identity. We, uh, and somewhere around adult, adulthood, we, our identity is formed, and somehow we carry that identity for the rest of our lives. Okay, so that we used to, that's the very psychologized, that's the way we used to look at it. Okay, so I want you to look at it in a different way, if you don't already. That, that we don't have one, it'd be impossible to only have one identity, because one identity as humans does not equip us with what we need in order to survive as humans, right? So we have not one, but a repertoire of identities. And I don't mean multiple personalities like schizophrenia, I just mean that you have one identity that's uh, in one context. So maybe at home, you, are, you have one, right? When you're around your buddies, when I'm around the buddies I, I grew up with, you enact a different ide identity. When you're around, um, uh, when you're at school as a student, there's another identity. When you're on the playground, there's another one. When you are with your children, that's another identity. When you're with your parents and family, that's another one. When you are at the workplace, you're, you have a professional identity, right? In the institutions, uh, we professors, we enact political identities, right? We, we have all sorts of stuff. And so identity is not one, but it's a, it's a repertoire, it's multiple, right? And, it's, and, we, it's, and we improvise it, like playing jazz or something. We, we, come, up, we come up with it, right? Where, no matter what the context. Um, for the crisis that I was referring to earlier in terms of uh, boys and men of color, um, there's substantial evidence, and of course this is common sense, we are exposed to a lot of trauma, right? We're exposed to a lot of trauma. I mean, um, some of our kids got to step over the dead bodies to, get to, um, to walk to school. I don't know, I don't know how, in what terms to put it. We're exposed. And, that, and there's, of course, there's a historical trauma, even as a Native American. We, we deal, we're still uh, dealing with the historical trauma in our particular situation as, um, uh, and, and just dealing with race in general in the United, in the United States, where um, uh, race, uh, kind of the history of, of, um, of genocide, cultural assault, ling linguistic uh, assault, um, uh, uh, stealing of the land, all that stuff, we're still dealing with that. So there's a historical trauma, but then there's also the trauma of just kind of growing up, in the, and especially in these impoverished uh, neighborhoods, of what it is to be a young boy and witnessing, let's say, one of your friends being shot and killed, right? Um, witnessing friends that you grew up with uh, getting lost um, to, to drugs and alcohol. Right? I'm, I, I myself work I, um, as a uh, volunteer chaplain, Native American chaplain. I, uh, I go into the prisons and I work with some of these wards and some of these prisoners. We do, um, we do talking circles, we do a, a sweat lodge ceremonies, we, um, we um, uh, work in detox, de detox centers. Um, 12-step program, all these things. Why? Because drugs and alcohol has really affected our community. So there's a lot of trauma that we're dealing with. And of course, if you're dealing with that trauma, you think you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be, be able to go to FIU, right? If you're dealing with that trauma, it's real, real difficult to get to where you're at when you deal with all this trauma. Um, so um, you, you can just read that on your own. Um, Here's some of the stuff that we do, and uh, depending on the time that we have left, I'm not sure who's monitoring the time, 
um, I can talk about all these different things because I know in this particular people in the room, they want to hear about the different projects that we've done, the different advocacy projects. How much, how much time? Uh, okay. All right. So just real quickly, um, LEAD is an umbrella. Of course, we like to use uh, the, a metaphor that's more Latin American. So we, it's una maca. Right? So instead of the umbrella, our metaphor is the hammock. Right? So it's, we're a hammock organization. And, and it encompasses all these things, the journal, the handbook, the NLEN, different partnership building, the, the networking. We, we host public forums, virtual uh, classrooms. Of course, you saw video production. We do regional alignments. We work on policy. We put on uh, college and career events our feria, we do cash for college, and of course our marquee event is, is the LEAD Summit. So I'll just talk a little bit about these real quickly. Um, so 20 years ago, when I started off, there wasn't a lot of information. Yes, there was research, but it was very sporadic, very here and there. Oftentimes it was the same authors, the same people that would get published over and over. And uh, so, the first thing we did is, well, we got we to create a, a, a journal. Now we're, we're a tier one academic journal. It's peer reviewed, scholarly journal. We're ranked 330 out of uh, more than 20,000 journals. Um, but it, it took 15 years to get to this point. And so uh, we see all our work as needing to be research based. So it's not just ideational. We're not just coming up with all these grand ideas. No. It has to be based on some kind of um, uh, of research, something, that, that, something that's um, verifiable, a, a problem that, um, that we can discern, um, something empirical, something based on field, um, being out in the field, that, that kind of stuff. So we, we, we started a journal, and, uh, and it, it, uh, I'm sure you have it here in your database. We're, we, we are... Um, we're indexed in, a, in like 70 different uh, uh, databases. But you know, your, uh, your Eric, your EBSCO host, your Wilson Omnifile, your, all the different common ones were there. So you have access to this. It's, it's, it's free to you. Of course, that gave away to the Handbook of Latinos in Education, which is sort of like a thick encyclopedia. Um, and what we did with the handbook is we declared, an, we declared it as an academic field. We are now a legitimate field of study. There are a lot of university professors who, in their title, it's written in there somewhere that they, what they do is they study uh, the field of Latinos in education. So what we did in the handbook is we, we, we laid it out. And here's, here's the five sections. And I was uh, lucky enough to be the, uh, the editor-in-chief for this. It, it took us about seven years to create it. Uh, a lot of work, uh, but if you don't, um, if you, you know, you should get your hands on it. If if this is your particular field of study, it's 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 sort of like lays the, uh, lays out the foundations. Um, then we create the the National Latino Education Network. What we found is a lot of universities, um, either intentionally or not, um, that a lot of both doctoral students, um, as well as Professors, they work in isolation, very alienating. The university can be very alienating. I don't know how it is here. You guys are a very large institution. You all are uh, a Hispanic-serving institution. Um, um, and, and so I just don't know the situation here. But in general, in the United States, um, you'll go to uh, graduate programs, and it's a couple Latinos here and there, right? And, uh, and then the professor. Uh, the professoriate, if you look at that, there's not too many Latino professors. So oftentimes we work in isolation and alienation. So what do we do? We have to reach out. One thing that Latinos that we're good at is that uh, we're good at reaching out and networking. Right? So I can get comadreando or whatever you want to call it, compadreando, whatever. We're real good at reaching out and get. so we're good at networking. So this, the NLEN predates the MySpace Revolution, all right. So we're older than the MySpace. So what we did is, we we call it an electronic barrio. We have a, a, a portal where people connect to, 
and we can start having conversations about the kinds of work that needs to take place uh, in, uh, in our community. Of course, the, I'll save the summit to the end based on our times. One thing you need to know is that LEAD is a volunteer-driven organization. Okay? So yeah, I'm a professor, so yeah, I'm a paid person. right? But it, everybody else is a volunteer. In fact, where I'm happy to say for the four years in a row, President Obama um, has given us the, that's another, that, I need to add that to the list of awards, the uh, 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 Volunteer Recognition Award. For, from the White House. So for four years running, our, our, our volunteers have, have won this. Um, in fact, here's the pin. I'm wearing the little pin. Um, and um, one thing I forgot to add is that um, I, I was lucky enough, I've been to the White House twice, that uh, President o Obama used the handbook of Latinos in Education to help uh, generate his edu the educational platform. Right, so because of that, he, he mentioned that in several speeches. I got to go to the White House, be there. And Patty and I, both of us, went to the White House. Um, but we're a volunteer organization. So when we, when we put on big events, um, everyone who's there, they, they're there because they, see, they want to be part of a cause. They want to plug into something bigger. Right. Okay. Um, one thing that we do when we put on our summit is yes, there's 1,000 or 1,200 people in the room, uh, which is great, but we sort of do what this gentleman is doing here. We set up cameras. Right? Why? Because we want to uh, collapse uh, time and space, all those barriers, and we want the most amount of people to be engaged. So we put on a one-day summit, when we talk, and when we talk about uh, the Latino crisis, we don't talk about it in, term, in deficit terms. We talk about these, these are the kind of solutions that seem to work. Right? These are the, the things that's going to help us get along. Um, we have a partnership with NBC Talk Radio. So we, we, uh, we broadcast it live on the radio. So you can listen to it on NBC Talk Radio. We, um, we have a partnership with Time Warner Cable. So you can watch it on the government channels. We um, webcast it uh, across the internet. Uh, and of course, we're linked into all the different social media stuff. Okay, there's our impact numbers. I won't uh, go into that, but we reach more than 18 million people doing these. Um, what we found is that for Latinos in education, the same themes come o reoccur over and over and over. So when you're talking to people, if you if you do a kind of a narrative analysis, these are the 11. I'm sure there's more, but here's the top 11 of the things that that um, go over and over. If you go to the LEAD webpage, which is lead.csusb.edu, you can, you can find it. But something that's particular to uh, the conversation we had earlier, uh, Dean Garcia, is uh, a couple things, right? Uh, one of them is build teacher and counselor education programs which have an explicit student home cultural component. Right? So educators not only be sympathetic, but appreciative and sensitive to students' backgrounds and willing to structure the schooling experiences to be compatible with students. Um, and here's the other one. Create qualified teachers that have specialized knowledge and skills in language acquisition, biliteracy, and cross-cultural learning. It's not enough to be a teacher. We know. The research shows you can't just be a teacher and all of a sudden you're teaching Latino students. It doesn't work that way. There's a whole other, there's whole other layers involved. Okay. In California, we have California uh, uh, ACR 137, which declares the last week of March as a week of advocacy for Latino education. Uh, I don't know if this exists in Florida, but if, if you're interested in, in, in uh, working with your legislators, uh, we will help you to, to, so you can, you can pass a resolution as well. Uh, here's our Feria Educativa. We have partnership with Telemundo, uh, their El Poder de Saber campaign. Uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, nominated by NBC News as one of their thought leaders. And what they do is that uh, all the thought leaders, we get in a room and we think, right? And we come up with solutions. <laughs> uh, so Telemundo, which is part of the NBC con conglomerate, uh, uh, two years ago we, we, we produced five television segments. You may have seen it. 
it, it, it's been running on Telemundo for the last uh, couple of years. So five segments in, in Spanish um, on, on uh, these issues, Latino education issues. Um, and we, we put on a big Feria Educativa. And uh, most recently, here with uh, the Festival Cardenas, we had, um, and I'm happy to say, that we had the largest educational fair for Latinos in the history of the United States. We had a hundred, check this out, 130,000 families show up to our college fair. 130,000 people showed up. It was at, it was at a speedway. And um, we had Los Tigres del Norte playing. Of course, that's a big draw. We had free food. But what we, what we found out is that we can't, we can't expect uh, Latino families to come to us at the university. We got to go to where they're at. So, so we put on a big Feria Educativa. And I know you guys have had Feria Educativas here in the Miami area uh, for a long time. So I know you guys do something similar. And, oh, and then with the Telemundo, we reached 54 million viewers with our projects uh, with Telemundo. We have a, a, a regional collaborative, which means even though we deal with international and national issues, we also see the need to collaborate here at, at the regional level. So in our region, which is called the Inland Empire, which is, in our, in, in our region is, is larger than 11 states here in the United States. We're larger than South Carolina, for example. Right? So our, our area is real, real um, distance. It's really far from each other. And we have to do strategic alignment. What does that mean? What it means is that a lot of us are working in silos. So one, uh, one group is doing this over here, which is great. Another group is doing this, which is great. But um, uh, what about getting together and creating some kind of coalition-based uh, agenda where, where we're able to sustain our projects, we're able to replicate them, and the last step would be to bring them up to scale. So one thing is if you find something that works, we want to take advantage of that, and we want, we, want to, we want more people to take advantage of that. So we want to bring it up to scale. So that's one of the things that we do. We have another project called Cash for College. Uh, and, um, in our area, uh, the schools did something very asinine, which was they let go, because of the, the budget cuts, they let go of a lot of their academic guidance counselors. So, so we don't have too many academic guidance counselors in our region. So what does that do? The kids don't know how to uh, fill out financial aid. They don't even know there's financial aid available to them. So we had to pick up the slack. So we, went, we jumped from eight FAFSA workshops, financial aid workshops, to one, more than 100. Right? And so we've, we've put on 300 workshops in the last few years. More than 11,000 families. We've helped more than 11,000 families get financial aid. And um, we've brought in... Um, uh, about $56 million into what otherwise would have been unclaimed financial aid. Um, the thing about our cash for college, and part of this has to do, because I served as the California commissioner, which means I was in charge of financial aid in the whole state of California. Believe it or not, I had a budget of uh, more than $9 billion with a B. And what are we going to do with that, you know? And so uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that came out of that was the Cash for College. So if you show up to one of our Cash for College uh, FAFSA workshops, your name goes into a lottery, and you could possibly uh, we'll add an extra $1,000 to your, to your package. So that's one of the projects that we did. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of go through some of these real quick. Um, one project that we have now, and this is inter maybe interesting to you all because uh, you guys are in HSI, which is a Hispanic Serving Institution. Do you guys know? Do, raise your hand if you've heard that term before, HSI. Okay, so that's not a lot, right? HSI is a federal designation, like the tribal colleges, right? Like the historical, like the uh, historically uh, black colleges. Um, what it means is that at least 25% of your undergraduate population is Hispanic Latino. And you are, are probably um, the number one 
numerically HSI in the whole United States, I, I would guess, right? Or up there, yeah. There you go. So, so that, so think about. It. So, uh, in, um, so you guys are out here, here uh, in California. We have seventy, just in Southern California, seventy HSIs. So now I'm president of the Southern California Consortium, and what we do is we, all the provosts and the campus presidents and the directors of minority and whatever and the directors of engagement, we get together. And, and we, we make decisions that are going to impact our region, right? Why? Because what happens here affects there and there and there and there. So this is one of our projects that we're working on. Um, uh, here's the newest project, Binational uh, Parent Leadership Institute. What we found out, and this will be the last slide because I, I know I've gone a little bit uh, too far, is that um, The research shows you have a good teacher here, and you have a strong parent here, that the, the child's going to be successful, right? So you have a good teacher, right, and, and a strong parent. So we can't just work with the schools. We've got to work with the, with the families, too, right? And all our projects are the unit of analysis is families. We don't work with students because we know students by themselves they don't, students aren't uh, uh, individuals in the true sense. We, the, our unit of analysis is the family, so we always engage families. So um, a, lot of our, a lot of the parents become parent leaders. They go to these parenting uh, programs, and they, it's great. But once they finish the parenting program, now what? So how do we get to these parents to the next level of leadership? How do you become a parent leader? How do you go in there? Because we know through the history of schools that the only thing that really has affected schools, um, other than, of course, um, uh, shifts in the economy and shifts in uh, federal policy, other than those things that take place in the larger context, is parents. Parents go in there and they start demanding and they start at making things happen, right? So parents are pivotal to changing the educational crisis. So we work with, with parent leaders. And um, so this is a new one. It's bi-national. So we're working with, um, in this case, we're working with uh, Mexico in our context, with Baja California and California coming together uh, to, to, an, to, to take parents to an advanced uh, uh, level of, of leadership. Okay, so here's the last thing. Um, I'm hoping to add, we're, we're hoping to add FIU to our list of, of uh, viewing chapters. All it means is that if somebody here at your university is going to watch our LEAD Summit, which takes place Thursday, March 27th, it's totally free. You can watch it on the internet. We will list FIU as a viewing, as a, a town hall viewing site, right? Um, and uh, the last thing is, if you want to uh, be added to our listserv so you get announcements, give us your business card or write down your email address on a piece of paper, and we'll add you to the database. So, I think that's it. So, yeah. <laughs> Hope I didn't bore you. I just try to give you as much as I can without uh, speaking to anything specific, but. Um, now's the time if you have something, uh, there's one in the back, oh, I said the dean. Uh, could you address uh, what are the three um, leading problems facing um, Latino uh, students, Latino population that uh, really play a major role in their educational achievement and in your mind, what are the three most uh, you know, pressing problems that we need to address? OK. Uh, if I can go back to that one slide of 11, I think you're, you're they'll, these are things that I think you all already know. I appreciate you and, uh, asking the, the question. Um, so in your position, of course, uh, has to have this breadth of uh, knowledge. But let me go back to this. There we are. Um, 
There's a lot. There's a lot. But I would say um, for you, I brought up the two because the College of Education, of course, um, having these, this home student cultural component, um, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, teachers and counselors and school psychologists and administrators are more often than not strangers to the very communities in which they serve. They show up at 7.30 in the morning, they leave by 4 o'clock, they're back on the way home. Um, but uh, you got to know the communities in which you serve, right? So we know from the research is the colleges, the, the, the teacher candidates who do, who fare the, the best are those who know what they're getting themselves into, All right? We have a lot of teacher candidates who are just kind of thrown into the classroom and um, they, 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 after I think, what is it, three to five years is, is seems to be an average. Um, uh, that's a big one. We, um, right now, I know I got frustrated as um, in the credentialing, in California we have credentialing courses, um, but we have a lot of scripted teaching now. I don't know how it is here, but here's a script. So of course in education, part of our problem has been the neoliberal discourse, the free market discourse, the idea that education is the primary function of our society and therefore uh, the economy should dictate everything. So uh, schools is almost like the last truly public space that we have in the United States. The space where you can, you can be around people that are different from you. Uh, 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 it could be class, it could be um, uh, ethnicity and, and cultural background, religion. Um, and uh, because of everything being privatized, now don't get me wrong, I believe in a lot of our projects are um, PPPs, public-private partnerships. We work with Telemundo, we work with H&R Block, we work with Cardenas Markets, we work with the Chevy dealer, so we're not afraid to deal with the, uh, dealing with the private, right? But of course, but there's this uh, a big movement uh, and it's taking place since the Reagan 80s um, uh, a nation at risk, um, and of course that's where the term at risk came about. And so, in, in my analysis, the term at risk is a continuation of the deficit thinking. Um, and so, as long as we're thinking in terms of deficit and deficit, we're we're not going to get too far. Um, so, because of the privatization, the neoliberal discourse, um, we don't even own the curriculum anymore. Houghton Mifflin owns the curriculum, right? Um, I don't know. So Dexo owns the foods, right? Is this it? Is it um, right? Uh, what's the bookstore? What's the other company that owns all the bookstores? Uh, yeah, but at university campuses, who who is it? Oh, okay. So as Barnes and Noble, there's another one. There's two, and of course I understand you have to make decisions, right? But a lot of, a lot of, of uh, you know, but this is a public institution, right, like where I'm at. So we have to at least take heed that there's that whole discourse, uh, neoliberal discourse in education that, that, that's kind of the undercurrent of where we're dealing with. Um, but going back specifically, the idea that um, teachers oftentimes are strangers to the very communities that they teach in. So, you got to know what you're getting yourself into, right? You, one of the things, one of the ideas that I, that I do in my class is I have the students create an, a, a community asset map. And you go out to the community and you find out, are there more liquor stores than there are um, parks, right? Do people own their home or do they rent? Where do people buy their clothes? Where do they buy their food? That kind of, you need to know, right? So... That's, I think for me, that, that's the big thing, is knowing the community and creating some kind of organic linkage. There was another. Yeah. 
that are uh, from environments that you may not have been exposed to growing up? Um, well, it, it's along the same lines. You, um, you have to create organic linkages. You have to go out there. If you get invited to the quinceanera, then go to the quinceanera. Then you're going to get a first-hand idea of, of you know, um, kids got a home life, right? Obviously. Um, the only cognitive map a child comes to school with is the cognitive map that they get from home, right? And so... Um, part of the struggle, of, I think, of being a teacher is to shed yourself um, of the deficit thinking. The fact that the child speaks Spanish is not a deficiency, it's not a defect, it's not a whatever. It's actually a pedagogical resource. So if you, if you can learn how to, with specialized, specialized knowledge, if you can learn how to take advantage of that cognitive map, you can tap into that map so then you can get the child to the to where he or she needs to go, right? So it is a lot of specialized knowledge. Unfortunately, uh, uh, and this is the case even at my institution, that nothing's going to fully prepare you for the classroom. There's just anybody who tells you that they're naive. No one's going to. You're just going to go there, and you're going to see for yourself what it is. But there. Um, but I kind of see being a teacher as having a driver's license. Just because you have a driver's license doesn't mean you're a good driver. I mean, you have, that means they let you into the classroom, and they say, somebody said, okay, come on into the classroom. But it takes, it takes a while, and it takes effort to really kind of know. So you have to know the community in which you serve. That, I think, to me, that's the number one thing. Um, um, uh, maybe uh, funds of knowledge. There's a whole uh, genre in education called the funds of knowledge. Um, Henry Treva, Luis Small, those folks. Um, uh, the idea being that um, in order to not be a stranger, you gotta, that's, that strong component, I, I think, is, is the strongest thing. The teacher, as a teacher, you gotta know um, the context in which the learning takes place. Right? Yes, sir. And there, and there was another one right there. One. Yeah. Families as well. And uh, we're seeing a harder time for parents to stay together or to be married. So you have a lot of kids being raised by yeah. single parents. What do you see as the best way to help young Latino couples stay together as a family and raise their kids? Um, one of our partner... Uh, projects um, deals exactly with that, with dealing with the fa the family issues. Um, I kind of look at it a different way. I, I used to teach. I used to work in a homeless shelter. I was a social worker, and um, and I uh, was fortunate enough to 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 teach people how to read and write. And when you teach people how to read and write, it's really a magical thing. Um, because their gaze is so much is so different, and I've had situations where I know women, especially um, in this homeless shelter, that uh, they were coming to class learning how to read and write. Um, they had to hide it from their partners or from their boyfriends or their husband. Why? Because education changes; it tips the balance of relationships. So. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to divorce, uh, right? Uh, uh, because I've had women in 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 these uh, kind of literacy classes who um, they wake up to their own oppression, right? Because when you're, you know, and Paulo Freire said it best: uh, reading the the word is reading the world. So as you learn how to read and write, you're also Waking up to the oppression in your in in your own life circumstances, so these women were yes they were learning how to read and write, but then they can start doing for their own. They don't have to depend on the on the man to do all these things. And in fact, in some cases, the man doesn't want them to learn. Why? Because it's part of the right. It's part of the the patriarchy in the home. Um, so in that case, education 
is a is a practice of freedom. It's a lib it's it's liberatory. Um, so I'm in favor of in that case in situations like that. I'm a, I'm in favor of the of that. But but at the same time, um, what does that present for the for the child? Right. I know, um, and uh, I mean, I'm divorced as well. So my children are the products of uh, divorce and and. They're experiencing a whole thing of going back and forth between the parents. It's, it could be a mess sometimes. And, and I didn't have to deal with that when I was a kid. I had a hard enough time just dealing with my own stuff. But they imagine that whole dimension on top of that. Um, so what uh, we work closely with one of our partners. We work the, with the Catholic Diocesis. And the Catholic Diocesis has, they have their own things where they help out. Of course, it's got the... It's, it's interspersed with Catholic dogma, and it's, it, there's religious, obviously, direct overtones. Um, but that seems to be um, the churches in the, in the, in the faith-based community seem to be carrying, doing that work. Um, so in some cases, I think it's uh, ni modo. I mean, there's the family breaks up. And sometimes, uh, I know it made me a better father. Uh, the irony is that I'm divorced. But divorce made me a better father. Right? That's a reality. At least for me. Yes. Hello. Okay. Yes. This this might be a a, a weird question, but when you say Latino, mm -hmm. since uh, we are from Miami and there are, is that specifically Mexican? Yeah. Is uh, that Native American Mexican or you know? Okay. So it so it's it's yes and no. Okay, so of course this goes back a long way. Are we Hispanic? Are we Latino? Are we? Um, of course, we know from research that most Latinos, and I say Latino just for convenient purposes, just to talk in very general terms. But we know most Latinos or people from Latin American descent, whatever, they they identify themselves with their nation. So, si eres cubana, puertorriqueño, salvadoreño, right? I'm Mexican. So, so our primary affiliation is almost always the nation state. But we know, again, from uh, the global economy, that even the concept of the nation state is almost a useless category in terms of our identity. Why? Because borders are there for people, but not for capital. We were talking about this at lunch. So money can go anywhere it wants in the world. Right? Companies, multinational companies, all these, they can go anywhere they want. But the borders are there. So, if, yes, we identify with our nation state. So what I'm referring to when I say Latino, um, most of the research I'm talking to is, is, uh, is, is, is pan. It's a pan-ethnic. For Cubans, of course, we know in the pipeline that the Cubans have always done a little bit better than the rest of us. Right? If you look at the pipeline, the reason why the numbers are higher uh, are because the, the, you, you add the Cubans in, right? But that's changed. Now, the, uh, the last five years, in the last five years, now the Cubans, and even here in Miami, they're, they're looking a little bit more like Mexicans. They're looking a little bit more like Puerto Ricans, right? So the whole effect of that first generation or generation and a, and a half of, of I, guess, I guess you would call it a, social and cultural capital effect that you have, uh, you have professionals coming from Cuba who left uh, 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 Cuba to come here and start over. And of course, if they're part of the professional class, then their children are going to fare better because they have more of that social and cultural capital. But unfortunately, we've seen in the case of the Cubans is that those numbers are, that that's, that's kind of fading away. And, you, and um, like I said, unfortunately, you see the new generation of Cubans in Miami that their numbers are starting to look a little closer to the rest of us. Dr. Murillo, what a privilege to be here today. My name is Olga Naranjo, and we're from Texas. Uh, my All question right. to you is, in the last three years, um, through forming a nonprofit organization, we've reached 10,000 children in six events. And my question is, what kind of program do you request or recommend, recommend for the what's next? You get them excited. You talk about school. We have El Mochilon. We get them dressed for success to start school. We have El Jugueton. Get them all empowered, ready to go. But what's next? It it's six months later before I see them again. 
what do you recommend for all of us that want to make America a better place oh, okay, for so, all these children? Well, first of all, thank you for coming. You came all the way from Texas. Just so, but what an honor that you came to Texas just to just to hear me speak. I'm I'm very humbled. Um, okay, so one thing we know from the research is multiple um, times. You hit the kid multiple times. You can't just hit them once with information. Just like the families, we can't bring them once to a Latino uh, kind of themed feria educativa, you know, uh, a college fair, and think that somehow that's going to flip their, the world. It's not. We hit them multiple times, right? So we, we, uh, we have campaigns. One of our campaigns um, uh, is besides the feria, we do the FAFSA. We, we have... Um, we, we do webcasts. One thing that's different uh, that uh, most people ha haven't uh, realized yet is texting. Um, some of our kind of research has shows that um, even the poorest Latino is going to text. Something like 78 or 80 percent, even workers, working class, uh, they'll have a phone, right? <laughs> and they're going to they're gonna text. So we have a project called Recados, which is um, R, K, and then the number two in Espanol, Recados, right? It's not fully developed yet, but we've, we've, um, we've done this project. Well, we'll send text messages. Now is the time to, um, to apply for college. Next week is, uh, is the deadline for your FAFSA, your financial aid form. Here is a link to do this. Here is a whatever. Text messaging seems to work. Um, because of our funding, we haven't like fully um, implemented it. We've just done it in real, really small basis. Uh, but it's part of the overall strategy if you hit it multiple times. So if, if, you, if, if you just think just one time, it's, it's not enough. You got to get them in the first grade, get them in the fourth grade, get them in the seventh grade. You got to talk to the parents. We, we have Super Sundays at our, where we go to the churches and, we, and, um, and they'll give us three minutes to give an announcement at church. Boom. Just a quick something. Um, and, and then, you know, if you have any questions, come talk to me afterwards. That kind of stuff. Um, so we hit them at the churches. We do this, we do that. And it's, it's just multiple, I don't know how else to say it. We just, you got to, that's, that's the next um, in terms of strategy, at least from what I've seen, in terms of advocacy, right? Yeah. Yes. Do you have much of a presence of uh, uh, Teach for America teachers in your system? Y yes. Uh, one of our partners is Teach for America. Of course, I've been criticized for the same, because Teach America, uh, one... One way to look at it, it's part of the privatization, it's part of the neoliberal discourse, right? Your, your, right? Um, um, it's also been, um, I guess, uh, accused of just kind of throwing people into, right? But um, there's a shortage of Latino teachers. And fortunately or unfortunately, Teach for America is one of the few people who understand that shortage and they are willing to take on Latino teachers and put them in a classroom so they can get some kind of experience. So, it, um, so the answer is yes and no. Yet we work with Teach for America because we want to increase the pipeline. Until we have our own, um, of course, there's a big movement called uh, Grow Your Own. I don't know if you all have your, your own Grow Your Own programs here. But w uh, one model is, again, since... since uh, uh, since teachers are, and, and counselors and psychologists are oftentimes strangers to the communities right, that they teach in, um, how do we get people who, are, who grew up in the neighborhood or in a neighborhood just like the neighborhood, um, how do we get them to become teachers? Right? How do we get the paraprofessionals who've been in the classroom for 30 years, how, do we, how, do we, how does that person, how do we make them a teacher? Um, how do we get, um, how do we identify high school students who already in high school, you know, the, the girl says, you know what, I want to be a teacher. How do we get them early on and then create a pipeline? 
Um, and, uh, and you know, we can, we can figure out a way to streamline it and make it easier for them, get rid of the red tape so they can, they can jump into the classroom right away. Um, and Teach for America is one of those projects that allows, that is actually increasing the Latino educator pipeline. And yes, there's a debate. Um, but as you see, we work, we work with all sorts of partners, right? So it's both good and bad. There's, there's, there's corporate interests. There's private interests. I personally like Teach for America for that reason. But it's totally legitimate. The criticisms, I think, are totally legitimate. Um, and you know what those are, right, in, in terms of, so uh, we, just, we work with whoever wants to work with us. One more? Okay, <laughs> one more. All right. No pressure, right? <laughs> this is great <laughs> because, um, quite honestly, um, you give a presentation, you, you just try to present as much as, much as possible. But the real, the, real th the real deal is the conversation that we're having now, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming, Dr. Maria. It's great to have you here. Um, I think you, you did a really great job of, of tackling the disparity in that pipeline between Latino students and um, other groups here, but what about even the disparity amongst that Latino population, particularly as it pertains to immigrant youth who are coming oh, yes. in, who may have been um, educated in, a, in another country or have dropped out in another country, and now they're coming in well behind academically, but also as far as um, the language gap. There's any, a new, we, there's, a, there's a good, um, we just, um, we're about to publish a, 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 an article here. Um, if you have a chance, look up Alejandro Covarrubias. No, Covarrubias. Alejandro Covarrubias. And he just did an analysis. Um, and it has to do with exactly that, uh, nationals, pe uh, people born outside the U.S. and how they fare in the, uh, and in general, of course, we know that, um, Immigrants in general are doing better. And a lot of it has to do with maybe the dual consciousness or um, the idea that, um, that uh, the U.S. is a land of opportunity. And so, uh, especially if where you came from, you know, you were worse off and now you're in the U.S., that there's more of appreciation for the opportunity. Uh, 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 Latinos, uh, Latin American nationals born outside the U.S. tend to fare better. But then what happens to the next generation? What happens to their kids and their grandkids? Right? So a lot of the analysis that I'm bringing up today really has to do with the kids and the grandkids. But there is. So Alejandro Covarrubias, if you look him up, you'll find um, uh, the pipe. You can actually see the pipeline. You can see um, of all the groups, Salvadoreños seem to be doing the worst. Right. Cubans are doing the best in terms of the out outcomes in the, and so Central Americans are, are, are doing, uh, faring the worst. And then uh, Puerto Ricans are pretty low as well. And then uh, Mexicans were like in the middle somewhere. So that, that's, a, that's a big issue, right, of uh, where were you born and, and so forth. Um, of course, um, uh, dream movement, right, is, is a big thing. And when I was commissioner of uh, financial aid in California, my job was to, uh, part of my first task was implement the California Dream Act. So we have the California-based Dream Act in California. And, um, and, um, and of course, uh, uh, I think, I say of course, because to me it's obvious, but, but we have a whole um, sector of our society who for all intents and purposes are American in every sense, although they were born outside the United States and don't have legal status, that they should be afforded the opportunity, access, and, 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 and to get into you know, higher education like the rest of us. Algo mas? Can everybody hear me? Yes. 
I wanted to uh, say thank you on behalf of Florida International University and the College of Education and everyone here. Your presentation has been exceptional and outstanding, and we have all, uh, I think, enjoyed very much hearing you and engaging in this conversation. So let's give a very a warm thank round you. of applause for Dr. Murillo. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I know we've got a few classes um, and a few professors here that brought their classes, so we've enjoyed the day. And look forward to the opportunity of collaborating with you in many of these exciting projects that you have. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Murillo. Gracias.